This video will be a history, analysis, summary and review of what is probably the best Half-Life mod we will have for a while, Entropy Zero 2. I will be talking about both Entropy Zero 1 and Entropy Zero 2. I will go into the story of both games and tell you everything there is to know about them. If you haven't played them, I highly recommend it. They are both on Steam, so they are really easy to get a hold of. My main question I will be asking and answering throughout this video will be, how will Entropy Zero 2 manage to change Half-Life forever? This video will not be spoiler free. Towards the ending of the video I will also voice a theory that will include heavy Half-Life Alex spoilers. I will warn you again beforehand. Furthermore, this video will require knowledge of the story of Half-Life and its expansions and also Portal, which you will probably have, but we also need some more nuanced points. For this I will sum up the teleportation plot point of the Half-Life story in about 90 seconds. Teleportation being the theme of every single Half-Life and obviously Portal game. First we'll have to go back to Black Mesa and Aperture Science at the times leading up to Half-Life 1. Both are rivaling companies. Aperture Science managed to figure out teleportation way earlier and with more ease than Black Mesa. Aperture Science had the first teleportation device ready by 1950, these portals being as simple as it gets. Black Mesa's teleportation consisted mostly of two gateways that are connected, similar to those of Aperture Science in a way. Zen aliens obviously are also able to teleport wherever they want, same as Race X aliens, which are creatures only seen in opposing force that were never confirmed as canon. They use pink portals instead of green ones though. Later in Half-Life 2, the Common and the Resistance are both working on intra-universal travel. While both were making advancements, the Combine were forced to travel around the world in conventional ways. The Resistance was ahead in the race, thanks for the teleporter in China's lab. The teleporter Nova Prospect was similar to that of Kleiner, it's only able to teleport a small amount of people and takes very long to charge, thus not being of great use for the Combine. During the experiments of Aperture Science and Teleportation, they did a very unsafe test where they teleported away an entire ship along with its crew and equipment, the Borealis. The Borealis has gained legendary status among everyone who is interested in teleportation technology, so the Combine and the Resistance. At the beginning of Episode 1, Alex steals some data that the Combine intercepted from Mossman. The only thing we see of this data is a transmission from Mossman, in which she talks about a big discovery. However, she gets stomped by the Combine before she can finish her talking. Later in Episode 2, where we reach White Forest, Kleiner and Eli take a look at the full transmission and see footage of the Borealis. It has been found by the Resistance. Kleiner wants to use it, but Eli wants to destroy it. It can be assumed that the Combine are very much aware of the Borealis as well, due to storming Mosman's location during her transmission. This is where the Half-Life lore ends thus far basically. Perhaps one day to be continued by Half-Life 3. The lore is not that important for the first chapter of this video. We'll be going through the first game of the two, Entropy Zero. Entropy Zero is a mod that is well known amongst the Half-Life community due to having one simple aspect that differentiates it from other mods. In this mod you play the bad guy. I know there is another mod that tried this, that horribly failed, but we don't talk about that one. We actually do a lot. In this mod you slip into the role of Bad Cop, who in his character kinda resembles people like Duke Nukem. He is sarcastic, completely stone cold in his killings and regularly makes fun of the people he kills and is basically an asshole in every sense of the word, which makes for a really fun protagonist. He is part of the Combine, a civil protection unit to be exact. Entropy Zero is seen through the perspective of a mask recording replay. Every mistake we make, like killing someone we shouldn't, is mentioned as a playback anomaly and that the tape is being rewinded, which I think is a great way to explain saving and loading kinda in-universe. So story-wise, everything you're doing has already happened and somebody or something is watching the replay. The replay happened 11 months before. The mod description mentions that the mod takes place in City 10, 11 months before the deployment of Gordon Freeman, which means that someone is watching the replay right as Gordon's adventures began. We begin in front of a building with a couple more combine units. It's snowing, which you don't see that often in Half-Life mod. Our assignment is to clear a rebel hideout, which is exactly what we do. In this rebel hideout there are tons of crates with the Black Mesa logo on them. Keep that in mind for now. After we clear the hideout, there is a skip forward in the mask we play, and we are on a train. Most likely on our way back to the base from the rebel base we just took care of. The train, as most trains in Half-Life mods, derails. We then move into City 10. A lot of the beginning of this mod is a pretty simple gameplay loop. Move through City 10 kill a couple people, solve a puzzle or two, then repeat. There are also these item crates that are trapped. I hate these. The amount of times I've died to them even though they literally only appear once in this game is insane. Pretty early on we find out about the so-called sea flu pandemic that is happening in City 10. The sea flu kills both Combine and humans. By order of the administrator, every citizen in Combine in City 10 is had to relocate to City 17 for vaccination and reassignment. Some rebels decided to stay though as they found out that the virus isn't as effective in winter. They still kept distance to major infected areas though. Let's talk about the weapon of this mod real quick. All of them got a bit of an overhaul. We get the stun stick as a melee weapon, which has a novel and a charge attack that does more damage. The pistol, which feels a lot more satisfying to use. It got a bit of a damage buff and a sound rework. The SMG was changed quite a bit. It got its damage buffed and a hefty recall nerf. Also the sounds got changed here as well. 
The AR2 you get in this game is actually only a prototype. I think in the time this mod plays at, the AR2 isn't actually really a thing yet. The prototype has a lot more ammo, a bigger clip, and fires faster with a high recoil and does more damage. It's a really fun and powerful weapon. It also got a sound change, obviously. It doesn't really resemble the AR2 anymore since the recoil is really bad on it. The shotgun got a sound change and a damage buff, but nothing else. The grenade is completely the same, I think. But we also get a new weapon, Manhex. You can deploy your own manhex that will go and attack enemies. Pretty cool. So anyways, we move further through the city. We have a dead strider shoot at a building, after which we have a bit of a stealth section. We sneak through a rebel camp in a courtyard. It's full of terrorists, so stealth is of importance. This segment is pretty cool, though I would have wished for a bit more variety. There are two main paths you can take, but as long as you crouch and you don't walk in front of people on purpose, there's basically no real danger. But it's alright overall. We get into the turret control place and manage to switch all turrets to shoot at rabbits instead. We also have a mention of Laszlo here, the finest mind of our generation, who is apparently responsible for the code that switches common turrets to shoot at the common instead. Laszlo left to go to City 17 as we find out. Rest in peace. We fight through another building full of rebels and find a trapped civil protection unit. We quickly find the button that opens the cage. In the same room however we find texts, scribbles of what seems to be a madman. It's quite a long text so I'll break it down for you. It's basically an apology letter of a rebel group leader. He talks about his encounter with the G-Man. G-Man offered him food and water for his group as long as he kept pushing equipment to City 17. After the main scouting group failed to come back, they had no more supplies to push. So G-Man tasked him with derailing a common train carrying important gear. This was the train we were on, carrying Black Mesa equipment. This stuff was then transported to City 17 to Eli and Dr. Kleiner. G-Man also promised to bring this leader to a better place, which, looking at his body, we will never know for sure. Continuing on with the mod. The guy we just had free shot us in the back. It turns out he was Barney in disguise. We get transported away and thrown into a hole by him and some other rebels. We miraculously survive this. This underground part is what I think may be the worst part of this mod. It's alright and better than a lot of mods. I just think it's a bit mazy and when I replay this mod I find this area to be a pain. This is very much partly due to me just disliking the episode 1 type of underground darkness with zombies though. So perhaps you'll have more fun at this part than I did, as it's generally done pretty well. Now comes the part that everyone agrees is pretty dreadful to play through again though. While interesting on a first time playing, man this part sucks to do again. You have to escort a stalker through a pitch black tunnel area. Your night vision fails and your only light is flares and the flashlight of the stalker. When you play this please remember to save frequently, but also not too frequently in case you hit save right before the stalker dies. This part takes a while. We arrive at some sort of express train to Pillar 10. Pillar 10 is to City 10 what the Citadel is to City 17. It used to be a combined stronghold, now taken over by Vortigons. Specifically, the Vortigons were interested in its core, which used an unknown science called Zero Entropy Stasis Technology. You see what they did there? Next you are in this little airlock with 10 buttons. You can enable or disable them. There are a ton of glowing lights in the rooms next to you. Genuinely, each time I've played this I was completely guessing and I think most people that played for this game did as well. After some time, the door simply opens. I believe the lights in the room in front of you blink green if you have completed one side of buttons. I have no clue how this is meant to be solved. Perhaps I'm the only one, so please tell me how this puzzle is supposed to work or how it makes sense. Next, the maker of this map made a simple mistake every level designer makes once in their life, which is why this part is the most replayed in every walkthrough. They expected the player to look up. Generally, if you're designing a level, it's a well-known fact that it's really hard to get the player to look up ever. So this part will have most players googling on how to get past these lasers, rightfully so, as you don't look up. This shoot the energy ball into thingy puzzle will repeat quite often, so yeah, look up when playing this mod. What comes next will actually be the first time you find out you have contracted the sea flu. You are luckily right next to a vaccination station. However, these only vaccinate you for a while, and you will constantly have to revaccinate. We fight against the first couple of Vortigons, one Vortigon telling us we will pay for what we've done. We get a peek at what seems to be a hunter that gets either awoken or revived by a Vortigon. Afterwards we have to open a door, which causes us to have to fight against stalkers. In the next room we have to face off against the hunter. A pretty decent boss fight, although there was a bit of a lack of cover. He runs off. We get to fight him again right afterwards though. This room is a bit more interesting. There are laser walls that enable and disable periodically, making for a pretty dynamic arena. We walk past some frozen combine, which is pretty cool. This leads straight into the final boss fight, which, as cool as it might look, sucks. Beating this on hard is next to impossible, I swear. It's just laser and infinite vortigant galore while you try to destroy three energy orbs using air 2 energy balls. It starts off a right with some pillars filling the room and some very high HP vortigons. But then the pillars drop, which leaves you with zero cover, after which two lasers sweep through the room, Gma death run style. These lasers also kill the Vortigons, but by the time they get to them, they already got off a hit on you, which is like full HP on hard difficulty. After you destroy all three cores, you fight off against one OP Vortigon. After you beat him, the entropy seems to hit zero and the core explodes. 
We now arrive at the current point. Turns out the footage on the mask was being watched by advisors. Impressed by your work and with them mentioning an old four returning, which seems to be referring to Freeman, they offer a consciousness transfer. This offer is mandatory. Your body gets lasered. This is where the game ends. Overall, this mod is very solid. The character you play as is fun. The weapons are all buffed to actually be fun to use and it's unique in the fact that you get to play as a bad guy. And I almost forgot to mention, the soundtrack for this mod is great as well. Now, there are mods that allow you to play as a combat before, like Human Error or Combine Combat, but I think this one nailed the feeling the most. With tons of lore-friendly tie-ins to the Half-Life story, there is next to no reason to not consider this one canon to the Half-Life universe as a whole, really. Obviously though, as I mentioned, there are some questionable decisions in the level design of Entropy Zero. While I think it looks great visually, I believe that some of the not-so-greatly designed puzzles will cause everyone that plays through it to visit the Bollocks YouTube channel at least one time. If I had to give this mod a rating, it would probably be 8.5 out of 10. Room for improvement, but it surely can't get much better. Can it? After Entropy Zero released in 2017, Entropy Zero 2 was first announced only about 5 months later. While the first announcement was in March of 2018, the release date was the 20th of August 2022. There was a big hype surrounding this mod, and oh boy did it deliver. So let's get into it. Entropy Zero 2 starts off with the player looking in the mirror, saying that we are apparently late for work, as we're told by one of our civil protection colleagues, who calls us by the name This is a number assigned to us. We arrive at the main desk and are reminded again that we are indeed late. Today we only have crab duty. We get into what that means in a bit. We can now move around this small combine checkpoint. And man, this is such a living place. Oftentimes you'll play half of two mods that feature a base of some sorts, usually with rebels, and none of them speak a word. This leads to the place just simply feeling completely dead, devoid of life. Here, every single other NPC has at least three lines of dialogue when you interact with them, and they also interact with each other. Talking with them, we learn that we are very much not respected by our colleagues. We are seen as a bootlicker, a suck up to the boss. It seems like nobody likes us here. All of them are voiced by people that are either well-known modders or YouTubers. If you guys ever need a metro cop with a thick German accent for Entropy 03, hit me up. We arrive at Crab Duty, which means we have to move through vents and kill headcrabs that are hiding in there. During our traverse through the vents, we see a couple of our colleagues talking about the past, one of them mentioning that they used to be a car salesman. They are at some kind of main computer where they can take a look at data about other civil protection units. They decide to look up you, in hopes to find something to mock you about. Your name is Aiden Walker and you used to be a prison guard. Your wife died and your kid was abducted. There was a big investigation with no lead, except for you, which caused you to be locked up. They also discovered that your selected perk is Family Cohesion Services, which means that you want to find out what happened to your daughter, because there is a possibility that the Combine could have the answer. The CPs are all in agreement that it was you that killed her. You start to hear your heartbeat rising. One of the cops saying, Let's make sure he never gets that perk. Your heartbeat as quick as never before. A drawn noise continues to rise. You have to stop them. You find a pistol, kick down the door and murder every single one of them. I have to point out the brilliant writing of this beginning bit. It sets up a mystery of the abduction of your daughter, a backstory for your character and gives motivation to continue on and find out. The character of 3650 instantly becoming relatable. This game also takes place from the perspective of a mask replay just like in Trophy Zero One. At least at this point, there is now a memory skip notification. You are now in an interrogation for killing your colleagues. The person interrogating you is the same one we checked in at earlier. We tell him that we won't do it again, to which we respond that it doesn't make it better. He also notes however that we are worth more than 5 of those guys, but we still need to pay up. We aren't put in a prison or anything. We will simply be relocated to the Outlands so that we can make up the credits. We learn a couple facts about how the combine functions through this intro. There are credits, and with enough good work, there are perks. By talking to another Metro Cop in the intro, we hear that he used his perk to get the combine to save his brother. The my brother. I got Continuing on with the story though, there's another memory skip. It skips to the beginning of Entropy Zero One. Turns out the entire first game was the Outland duty we did, because we killed those guys earlier. The game up to this point took place even before the first game. Before we breach the building, there's a memory skip again, and the story continues where Entropy Zero One left off, with us getting grilled. Accompanied by stunning visuals, we are talking about how we got to this place, how the karma recruited us. 3650 talks about how people used to tell him he wasn't normal. He was medicated, outcasted, and everything got taken from him. The Combine, however, listened. They told him that The problems of the mind are not the problems of the soul. I only had one thing to give up for this job. My humanity. Some would say, I never had it anyway. Next thing you see is some kind of scanning process. You see yourself in what I believe to be a mirror similar to the beginning of this game. 
moving downwards in a pod. You are now a combine elite. You come free and immediately get confronted by end lions. This is where we find our first weapon, the prototype gas pistol. The pistol has infinite ammo. It has a primary shooting attack which consumes 10 of the 50 ammo it has. And you are able to charge a shot using secondary attack. The ammo regenerates pretty quickly. And if you manage to deplete it, you will reload it by pulling on it, which immediately refills it. So this thing is basically always ready to fire. I'll also mention the other weapon you have at this point, that you probably remember from the intro where you kicked on the door. The kick. The bind for this is V, which you can configure of course. This is the game's melee attack, which I think is a great addition. You no longer have to switch to your crowbar to open a crate or kill a headcrab real quick. It can also be used to open doors, which is not really as practical as it is cool in most cases. Legit, this feels so cool, especially when you use it to surprise attack an enemy. You find a monitor with a picture of the destroyed citadel. This means this game takes place sometime after Half-Life 2. We move into a room with a monitor where an advisor is talking to us. The advisor explains that we are the last remaining one of our copies. I think it's interesting to learn that, according to the law of this, a lot of the common elites we fight at Half-Life 2 should in theory be copies of 3650. Well anyways, we get told that the operations of the combine in this area have been interrupted and that the administrator is dead. Our mission is to capture the person that enabled this, Judith Mossman. In return we have already received our will and faculties back. Also a dropship has been sent to extract us. We now start moving through this facility. Immediately we find the station on which we are getting lasered at the end of Atropy 01. This facility turns out to be Nova Prospect. You have to fight through some end lines, which are actually retextured to fit more into the Half-Life Alex version of them. You can also build up your squad like you did in Half-Life 2 with the Rebels in City 17. The levels look astonishingly beautiful. Nova Prospect has since we've last seen it in Half-Life 2 been way more overrun by end lines. When I first played this I had a bit of a gripe with this mod, which perhaps some others have as well. Perhaps I could take that gripe away a bit. In this mod there are a lot of Left 4 Dead 2 like notifications for certain things, like when you're supposed to throw a grenade in end lion holes, relocating turrets, and a ton of other examples later on throughout the game, which I won't tell you about now. At first I thought this was kinda cheaply done as there surely are better ways to explain this. It kinda takes you all the experience to constantly be reminded you're simply playing a game and to basically be told, here are the hints on how to beat it. But I have since figured out that this can easily be explained in lore, as simply overlays of the common elite's mask. Common elites are, well, elite, and it would make sense for them to have these kind of things integrated into their vision. That's how I explain it anyways. Moving on, we move through areas we know and love from Half-Life 2. Now looking completely different, we also receive our next weapon during this part, the AR2. It got a bit of a damage buff, a bit more ammo capacity for both bullets and energy balls. It's closer to the AR2 of Half-Life 2 than it is to Entropy 01, which makes sense if that of Entropy 01 was a prototype of what we got in Half-Life 2. It also got its animations redone, which is true for all weapons of this mod. We also received the SMG or MP7 as it's actually called, which is basically the same as it was in Entropy 01. Also do note, each time I mention a damage buff, that the enemies also got their health buffed, which means any damage buff is perhaps not as noticeable as you might expect. There are a ton of small graphical improvements, like parallax corrected cube maps, which really go a long distance and making maps look better. I think there's a limit on how far Half-Life 2 mod should have its look upgraded if it plans to take place in the same universe, and I think Entropy 02 is walking pretty nicely along this line. Some better particle effects and stuff like these reflections fit perfectly and make the mod look a whole lot better. We eventually get to the extraction place, which we have to blow open using slams, which is a cut weapon from Half-Life 2. You do get to use them in Half-Life 2 Deathmatch though. You can toggle between trip mine and shape charge mode using right click. You can attach them to walls or throw them on the ground and detonate them by pressing T. We fed the place off from end lines together with our squad. We face off against the end line guard which also had its looks change a bit and then get extracted. Right as we leave the common get flooded by end lines. Unit sleep gets initiated which also means that everything we're seeing is no longer a replay it's actually happening live. We awake as the dropship gets shot out of the sky. We are now in an arctic region. We also receive our next weapon, the MP5K. This weapon was originally cut from Half-Life 2. It has a burst fire mode and a secondary auto fire mode. The recoil on this weapon is even worse than the one on the MP7, so you will probably rarely be using it. I can tell you that this is the last SMG you receive in the game. Looking at early gameplay teasers, it seems like we were supposed to get a different SMG at first, the cut OICW. While it would have been cool to see, I couldn't see it fit into the big arsenal of the SMGs you already get. Also you might have noticed at this point that every weapon has its own original crosshair. A pretty cool detail I think. We now face off against our first couple of rebels in this mod. Again, really beautiful and good level design. We reach a building of a facility called Arbeit Communications. Arbeit, or as it's pronounced in German, Arbeit, being the German word for work. Right after we fought against all those rebels on our own, a ton more drop and gunships arrive. We now fight through the offices of Arbeit. These levels are insanely fun. We also received a shotgun here. It's pretty much the same except for a damage buff and some new looks and sounds. It also got a nerf though, which reduced its max ammo capacity down from 30 to 18, which I think is fair. The shotgun is easily the strongest weapon in Half-Life 2. 
We also received grenades, which are unchanged from Half-Life 2. Although it is to note that all weapons that we know from Half-Life 2 will switch out for higher poly versions, which you might not be aware of when playing, but definitely notice subconsciously at least. These models are incredibly well done. We eventually arrive at the controls of an airlock and see a lot of resistance members here. Among them, someone known as Radio Guy, voiced by Mitch Venswein, who you might know from the Lambda Generation channel. I think he did good work on the voice acting, though I think his voice sometimes sounds a little louder than others. But I would never hold that against him. This is also the first time we find an audio recording. In this one, we hear Radio Guy talking about some weird events happening at Arbeit. Every time we rotate the guards, we think of our watches. By the time they come back, they're hours out of sync. Whatever it is Jude and Seven are looking for, it has to be close. There are a lot of these to find about Arbeit. I let you know where we come by some important ones. There is also this monitor where we see that Mossman has been here recently. This is also where we catch the first few glimpses of a combine elite just staring into the camera, which will be important later. A small detail I would like to note here is that they actually went out of their way to change the camera feeds on this prop. Most mods that feature this prop just have an unaltered version of it, which has security cam footage of the beginning levels of Half-Life 2, which makes no sense in most mods where it is a seam. So I commend the team for making the effort. We also meet a new enemy here for the first time, Jumpy Rebels, which is probably not the official name, but that's what I'll be calling them. Jumpy Rebels can jump higher by using a Tau Cannon powered jetpack. They also have the same shoes Shell has in Portal, which allows the person wearing them to not be affected by a big fall. We move our way through this warehouse, guarded by a rebel sniper. We then move through a heavily trapped room full of explosives, which you always love to see in Half-Life mods. Then we get to see the resistance all leaving the place in cars. Mossman has escaped. In another audio recording of the radio guy, we hear him talk about the resistance looking for a missing elite combine in the basement. The team didn't return, all that was found was a pile of blood and scraps. As the radio guy nicely puts it, Something much worse than the combine is down there. We also find this combine unit that was supposed to be interrogated. After bringing them a weapon, they join our squad and are noted to have privileged cognitivity and that they are able to reassign subordinates' weapons. Pretty neat. After another wave of rebels, we eventually get into the airlock ourselves. The Overwatch voice reminds us that failure to capture Mossman will result in us not getting the investigation perk. This is also where the combine radio cuts out. We move through the airlock and find Radio Guy again. He mocks us and tells us to have fun finding your buddy in the basement. <laughs> The door to the basement has a common elite drawn on it, with the words stay out. Entering it, we will find this room. You may notice how it looks similar to the one we saw in the G-Man cutscene in episode 2. The wiki notes that this mod retcons that cutscene we saw with G-Man to actually have taken place here. So according to this mod, this is what that scene should have looked like. From Black Mesa. <laughs> I acted in the face of objections. Right after entering we immediately get hit by some sort of energy wave, which shows us what seems to be a ghost of an elite combine walking through the glass door. We get another glimpse of the elite combine on the monitor. Then we see the ghost elite fighting against ghost rebels, the bodies of them actually laying there, not as ghosts. We walk in the room with the dead bodies and see a giant monitor. On it appears the combine elite we've been seeing previously as well. They tell us in a real glitchy voice that they have been waiting for us to show up. When we ask them, Who are you exactly? They respond with, the protagonist starts to doubt this, as we were supposed to be the last clone. Clone Cop, as we will now be calling him, tells us that this wouldn't be the first time they lied to us. He proves it's him by calling 3650 by his real name, Aiden, and mentioning Ava, our daughter that got abducted. Clone Cop asks us why they would keep the memory of that in us. We respond that we're more effective with our faculties. Clone Cop responds with... To which the transmission ends. So as it turns out, we are not the last remaining clone. This is also the missing common elite the radio guy was talking about, and that was warned about on the garage door. Moving around this place, we come across weird anomalies, where props are floating around and your vision gets distorted when you go near them. We also see an image of the Borealis. The power goes out, to which the game turns into a bit of a horror game. On our way back to the generator room, we come across a blue headcrab that teleports around. We also see these zombies covered in blue goo. This causes you to take damage when you get too near to it. We will learn what exactly the school is very soon. On our way to the basement to turn the power back on, we hear our team get killed. When we return to them, we see a large trail of the aforementioned blue goo going down an elevator shaft. We now have another one-on-one -on -one conversation with Clone Cup. He tells us that the rebels are hiding something huge in this place and that the Combine wanted badly. He tells us we were sent here because the Combine needed a specialist and that we will be thrown out after this is done. We respond that us getting thrown out is bullshit and that we are an important asset to the Combine. Clone Cop says that the Combine control you by never giving you what you want. He tells us that we should forget about the Combine and work together and get what we want together. We don't believe this at all and threaten to kill Clone Cop. Clone Cop seems disappointed that we are against the idea of working together. Clone Cop detonates explosive to throw us in the basement which looks very portal-like. 
When I first played this, my jaw literally dropped. They really went there. They put Portal and Half-Life together into a game. While it was clear both take place in the same universe and references to each other were made, never have we seen any kind of crossover between them in any physical form. We are forced to go through an aperture science material emancipation grill, which causes us to lose all our weapons. We go into another room and find the turrets from Portal, which is just so cool. Some mods have tried this in the past, but never has it felt as authentic as it does here. It's perfectly executed. We meet Wilson, a bare-bones turret that talks to us. Wilson knows about Clone Cop and is here to help us get to the surface. Clone Cop told Wilson that he'd make sure we'd end up down here. Seems like they were friends before. Wilson is able to open doors for us and is generally an awesome buddy to have tag along. He has a ton of voice lines and you'll grow to love him while playing. Easy. Let's go. This underground section is the most perfect mix of Portal and Half-Life aesthetics there is out there. You can't find better currently. You actually get to do a puzzle. For a good example of how conversations between you and Wilson usually go, listen to this one where they talk about this test. What is this place? Uh, that is classified. <laughs> that was a joke. Yeah. Uh, so, um, they build test chambers here and test the, um, testability. For what? For, uh, testing. Testing what? Now, for that, I really can't tell you. It's hard-coded. I, I literally cannot tell you. In this place, we will come across multiple of the anomalies that were seen earlier, all of them featuring the Combine Elite, which we now know to be Clone Cop. We also get to listen to audio recordings of him spending his time here. We get to hear how he slowly turned against the Combine, once working for them. We then hear a pretty scary growl. Wilson notes, Your clone called him Plan B. The reveal being that this is a gnome, an enemy only seen in Half-Life Opposing Force. The model for this guy is great, created from scratch. After he jumps across a giant leap, we see him consume an entire corpse in front of our eyes. Pretty scary guy. This also confirms that the events of Half-Life Opposing Force are considered canon in this story, thus making Race X an actual thing in the lore. Also, oh damn boy. I'm not really mentioning it anymore since there is no need, but this entire game is so incredibly well designed, both looks and gameplay wise. It's also incredibly written and all of the soundtracks are so so great. Almost every song you've heard in the background of this video is taken either from Entropy 01 or Entropy 02 soundtrack. The weapons are all so satisfying to use and the addition of these audio recordings gives such a big boost in the world building and storytelling. One I'd quickly like to mention is this one where Clone Cop speaks on the fact that the radio guy locked him up down here in the basement. Small world building details like this add so much to this world, I love it. Back to the game though, we find this projector that is showing us a summary of data of the Arbite Anomaly, which is heavily classified as it seems. I'm gonna summarize some of these points to make them a bit more understandable hopefully. It starts off with the fact that anomalous broadcasts from Arbite communications were perceived to contain aperture science technology. The investigation began initially as a legal measure. It turned out, however, that the Aperture brand data was received due to the technicality of the anomaly rather than illegal duplication of technology. The first subject of the finding is the anomaly itself, which consists of a temporal disturbance. The data signatures of the device indicate that this construction has not been created yet, but will be created at an unknown date in the future. Subject 2 is the area of influence. The area of influence appear as spherical volumes in which time distorts itself. Scientists noted watches stopping, which sounds similar to what we heard Radio Guy talk about on the first audio recording we heard. Subject 3 are temporal overlays. It's noted that these have been causing distress at Arbeit, due to it seeming like ghosts are walking around. In reality, these have nothing to do with an afterlife of any sorts. These are described as knots in time, which happen when someone or something passes through an area of influence. These temporal overlays can then be seen later if the particle fields surrounding the area are disturbed. This is what we saw earlier where we saw the Elite Combine. Seemingly, this was Clone Cop from the past. Subject 4 is a temporal washover phenomenon. This one swoops through the area of influence. They excite molecules in the air and can be visibly observed and felt. It's unknown why exactly this happened. Subject 5 is cellular distortion. It basically describes what we saw in that blue head crab. It's when living cells absorb temporal molecules. The teleportation happens as a result of stress or pain. Subject 6 is the temporal wall, which only happens close to the singularity nucleus. It's described that inexplicable visual disturbances can be perceived inside the wall membrane. The passage of time is also altered. The last page is basically a document that shows us how Aperture Science bought Arbeit Communications and that they will be working together in the future. They would also be building an entropic control facility to stabilize the anomaly for study. So whatever is hiding here is something incredibly important and incredibly powerful. Back to the gameplay. 
This section is basically the Jeff chapter from Half-Life Alex, combined with portal puzzles. It's great. We eventually get to Clone Cop's place of residue down here. We see a map of the Arbite facilities and things in between. We hear an audio recording of Radio Guy talking about Mossman moving to Arbite 2. We also hear another audio recording of Clone Cop talking about Mossman currently being at Arbite and that she is working with the rebels and that they are going after the project. Clone Cop mentions his interest in the project, which we also saw earlier when he told us we should work together to get it for ourselves. We also hear another recording of him explaining that he has ripped out his transponder and is going solo. He's making sure the Combine do not take his memory of Ava away from him. We also received the 357 here. It got a damage and ammo capacity buff, some beautiful new animations and wonderful new sound design. We now face off against a Gnome in a Portal 2-like puzzle area. This is literally so unexplainably cool. It's a pretty dynamic arena featuring some zombies that come out of the blue goo. Oh, and by the way, here's Wilson's explanation of what the blue goo is. What is this bullshit? It's modified phytoplankton. What does it do? Yeah, it's constant. Keep the fight is pretty good, but I think the blue goo zombies were a little much at times. With everything going on at once, I think it's next to impossible to go through this area without taking damage, which can be really bad if you somehow find yourself in a situation where you only have like 5 HP or something. Loading a safe should never be the only option. On our way out of the basement, we find Zen Relay Grenades, and oh boy these are cool. The next room was designed perfectly for the player to try these out. They suck up everything nearby into a Zen portal, and relative to the amount of mass they suck up, they will spew out a mix of Zen enemies and items. Among these, there are Half-Life 1 style medkits and suit batteries. I fanboyed out so hard when I saw these, it's embarrassing to admit, but what a cool detail to add. Also, through Zen Relay Grenades, we get to fight enemies like Bull Squids or zombies in AGV suits like they were seen in Black Mesa the Half-Life 1 remake. There are a ton of classic enemies in this mod, which we'll get to later. This is a place where Wilson can be left behind, which you won't do because you're not a monster. I seriously encourage you to carry him all the way through the game. Not only is there a ton of unique dialogue between the two waiting for you, but a ton more that I will tell you about when we get there. An audio recording has to be played in order to progress. What we hear in it is also very pivotal to the story. which is something that definitely is not allowed to happen, as our mission was to capture her for interrogation. In the elevator, Wilson tells us about something he needs help with. Say, if you're taking me with you, maybe you could, uh, help me out? Nobody else is looking after this place. Our right 3 has an AI mainframe, but it, uh, has no real cognitive functions. If you can get me into an AI upload station, I could, like, run the place. I can help you out. Wilson, I swear on my life, even if it's the last thing I'll do, I'll get you to that upload station. We finally get up to the main floor of the building. A lot of Combine have arrived since. The advisor has a word with us. It asks us where Judith Mothman is and demands no further setbacks. Time is running and we are tasked with reaching the second group. By second group, they mean another group of Combine waiting at Arbite 2. After a quick hunter jump scare, we get out of the parking lot where we saw the rebels leave earlier in their cars. This level is probably one of the most visually stunning ones. We get an air delivery here, a brand new APC for us. We're even able to attach wheels on the top of it, so he's easy to bring along with us. Unlike some other fellow we have to bring along in another game. Also at this point I had probably the most fun glitch with Wilson. For some reason whenever I somehow touched him it would send me flying. I spent like 15 minutes just using him as a trampoline. I wasn't able to replicate this glitch though sadly. The APC has very nice controls and feels great to drive, although it has a tendency to flip over when taking a corner. I must note that the alternative to placing wheels on the APC is pretty shitty. You get to attach a singular item crate to it. Just seems kind of meh. I would just like to see a statistic of people that actually did this ever when playing. But I guess that's what people deserve that don't bring Wilson along. You now start moving towards R by 2. Along the way you're able to find cages that you're only able to open using Wilson. Which is a big reason why bringing him along is so important. We also get the RPG here. Which is just the same as Half-Life 2 but with rework sounds and animations. The driving section of this game is generally really enjoyable. We also get probably the coolest introduction to a new enemy I've ever seen in the Half-Life mod. Pit drones make a return, previously only seen in opposing force. They are a neat addition. Along your way you will sometimes come across crates that emit sounds of enemies. It seems like a lot of Zen and Race X creatures were being transported between Arbite locations. 
At times during the driving sections, it got a bit enemy spammy. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy driving over a pit drawn as much as the next person. But it just felt like it was slowing you down at a certain point when you have a total of 20 Zen and Race X creatures along the path. We arrive at the monitoring station which collects data from RY2. We are forced to get into its control station in order to open the gate to the way ahead, which involves enabling three power stations. Traversing through these areas, we find a ton of anomalies. We are definitely getting closer to the project. Moving through all these anomalies probably caused quite the stir in space time. Suddenly we hear an alarm. Lockdown initiates. The data recording screen is going off the charts. What seems like a washover happens and we see the Borealis itself driving through the place. After this, the lockdown ends and we manage to open the gates. Honestly, what a cool and great way to show the Borealis. We get stopped again. This is where we find the crossbow. On our way to open the gate, we find a zombie gaunt. These are so cool and it's honestly a surprise we didn't ever see these in the original Half-Life games. Great addition. On our way back to the gate, we face off against some normal Vortigons. Some of them wearing hats made of parts of end lines, Which is honestly really cute and makes me feel bad for killing them. After a bit more driving, our APC gets destroyed by a roller mine. We see Clone Cop in person for the first time. Seems like he's ahead of us. He says that the rebels are on his tail and we need to distract them for him, which is not something we want to but will inadvertently do. We hear Radio Guy talk on speakers. He mentioned that Mossman has reached Arbeit 2 and is preparing a transmission to White Forest with everything they've gathered. This next place we go to is Cave Johnson's house, or one of the many he had probably. We fend off against rebels and then enter the mines. We find a place filled with Zen and Race X enemies. And growings, I guess. Here we find the Stuka Bats. The Stuka Bats are a cut enemy from Half-Life 1. Stuka is a dive bomber plane. Which is probably where it got its name from. It sorta of just flies at the player. Yeah, I love to see cut content return, but this enemy feels a little dry. And also this one is rarely used in the mod. The pink portals of Race X make a return. They can be closed by throwing a Zen relay grenade inside of them. We also drive past wall launchers and a minecart, though we never get to use them. We now arrive at R by 2, where the Combine are preparing to storm the building. We peek through the window and see something incredible. We see Judith Mossman recording a transmission that we saw in Episode 1 and 2. This means this game takes place between Half-Life 2 and Episode 1, or right at the start of Episode 1 at latest. The original transmission also gets stopped by Combine Elites and the Hunter, just like we are doing right now. This is so well thought out and created. I love this so much. Now, as close as ever to Mossman, we start chasing her. I must mention the great variety of small props there is in this game. There are distinct Arbeit Communications health packs. Traits of Arbeit and Black Mesa are placed around this mod fittingly. There are even distinct Arbeit Communications suit batteries. This is such great attention to detail, which made me fall in love with this game even more. While moving through the building, we get into another conversation with Clone Cup. It seems like he's in the same building as us. This time we take initiative and ask him what he's possibly trying to achieve. Clone Cop mentions again that what the rebels have found here is really important, and whoever controls it wins this war. We ask him why he would want all of this for himself instead of helping the Combine, stating that we aren't treated like the others and that they see something in us. Clone Cop tells us that we are a willing slave and that he's only in this for himself. He gets interrupted by Combine soldiers, which he starts shooting at without hesitation. We mention that we need to stop him, as this is making a bad impression. After continuing our way through Arbeit 2, we find something that isn't an upload station, but a transport for Wilson. He simply gets placed a bit ahead so we get a break from having to carry him. What follows is basically a big arena that gives us great uses for all the weapons we have, a shootout like no other. We hear the radio guy exclaim to the rebels that everyone needs to fight, as this is a final stand. It does really feel like a battlefield. The rebels eventually fall back. We've won this battle. We find back to Wilson, fight against some Aperture Science turrets and return triumphantly to a squad. Mossman, however, is nowhere to be found. The entire place is surrounded, so there is no way she escaped. She is still around here somewhere. We tell our squad to go look for her on the surface, while we go search for her at an excavation site. We do find a couple rebels here. This place we're entering seems serious. Wilson mentions he doesn't have a clearance for this area. We find workstations around the excavation site, which is massive by the way. Rebels are burning hard drives, papers and seemingly everything down there. They really don't want the Combine to know what they were doing down here. Fighting our way through this absolutely massive excavation site, crossing the biggest minefield imaginable with the help of then relay grenades, we catch a glimpse of Mossman at the control of an airlock. Also, another very neat detail, the person that is with her the entire time is also the same guy that was with her in that airlock in Half-Life 2. Great detail. Support arrives and we start chasing Mossman and the crew. We arrive at Arbite 3. We leave Wilson to pick him up later and enter a warehouse. Mossman and her team are stuck in a control room, the path to which is blocked by a huge locked door. We hear Radio Guy exclaim that they are stuck and need help. As soon as we start the large contraption that is here to cut open that door, the true final stand of the Rebels commences. An epic shootout between the Combine, Rebels and Vortigaunts begins. A large Zen portal opens which causes a ton of aliens to enter the warehouse because why not? So we have another shootout against a ton of zombie guns, ant lions, ant lion guards, bull squids, pit drones, multiple gnomes and head crabs. Which are in the style of Half-Life 1 by the way. Neat detail. We finally get to enter the control tower. We hear Radio Guy cry for help. 
bad news for us though. We hear someone else as well. Seems like Clone Cop is about to get his wish fulfilled, which he mentioned in that one audio recording. We only see the shadow outline of both of them. Radio Guy seems to be telling him everything. Clone Cop got his revenge. Radio Guy is dead. Clone Cop knows all the information now. So perhaps by connecting all the dots, the fact that we are in the Arctic, Radio Guy mentioning a ship, and us seeing the Borealis pass through the building earlier, might be starting to speculate. Perhaps the project is the Borealis. This idea seems to get confirmed immediately afterwards, as we stand behind a bulletproof window and see tons of images and blueprints of the Borealis being deleted by Mossman. Will this mod really go there though? We managed to get into the room using our vent. We kill everyone inside, except for Mossman, of course. Mossman actually talks to us a bit. They were definitely very limited in terms of voice lines for her. Using AI, perhaps a lot more voice lines could be added today, which was done by someone else in a cancelled mod for Entropy Zero 2. You can check out their video in the description, it's pretty cool to see. Though I get why this wouldn't be included in the official game, as it brings up the moral question on if AI is okay to use, which I don't think this mod wanted to face. Mossman reluctantly agrees to come with us, seeing there's no other way out for her. Clone Cop arrives right after us. He explains that he thought we would get it, but now he has to kill us. We get into a chase sequence together with Mossman. We run down the tower as we're being closely chased by Clone Cop. We return back to the warehouse and arrive back in the arms of the Combine as the doors close behind us. We escape narrowly with Mossman. She gets apprehended and transported away. This is so cool! It's bossy to intervene this deeply into the story. But seeing as we don't know what happened to Mossman after Half-Life 2 except for her transmission, this could very well be considered canon. We will get further into that question later though. We have another talk with the advisor. Our primary objective is completed. The advisor mentions that they are only no pieces of Judith's discovery and that they will tear out every piece of information from her. The advisor also explains that the Greater Resistance is not aware of the happenings here at Arbeit. The advisor gets interrupted by the camera feed, which shows us Clone Cop killing a bunch of Combine. The advisor mentions that this is our next objective. We have to hunt down the Clone Cop. By the way, big shout out to Trivi, who voiced the advisor. Great job. We get taken to where Clone Cop is going which is a side path in the control tower. Wilson mentions that the AI upload station he mentioned earlier is somewhere in this facility. Entering this place, we find the Entropic Control Facility, the place constructed in a collaboration between Aperture and Arbeit that was mentioned earlier as well. We meet Clone Cop again. We ask him what it is they're hiding, Clone Cop saying that we wouldn't believe him anyways. He messes with the thermostat, which means that the cave will soon be collapsing. We hear the classic alarm sound we know from Half-Life 1. A warning for a wash-away event gets announced. We get hit by it and are in what looks to be the Borealis filled with a ton of temporal disturbances. We get thrown back into where we were. Wilson, if you still have him around, which I hope you do, mentions that we were gone for a split second. Another washover happens. We see Clone Cop on fire in pain, disappearing immediately afterwards. Is this something that happened in the past? We then see a bright glowing core. A poison headcrab comes in contact with it, which transforms it into a blue headcrab and can teleport. Shortly afterwards, Clone Cop enters and goes into contact with it himself. The washover ends. We hear another warning that the cave is about to collapse. We reach some kind of reactor core or something. Clone Cop again pleads for us to work together. He mentions that the Combine would give anything for the secret behind those doors. We completely deny the request to work together and instead get into a fight with him. A pretty cool boss fight I must say. Clone Cop has now received the ability to teleport. We get into another watch over. Clone Cop and Wills are standing in front of us next to an explosive barrel. We fire at it, setting him on fire. Where we saw him burning earlier, we were seeing the future. The cave is seconds away from collapsing. We managed to flip the switch and save it though. We also get the epic title drop in the sequence. Zero. Wilson was badly hurt by the explosion as well though, now missing a leg. Wilson mentions that he is not well. We have to find the upload station quickly in order to save him. Clone Cop talks to us again. He got damaged so badly in the explosion that his voice filter breaks. We hear his real voice, which is also our real voice. He mentions that everything belongs to them, and that we should have never signed up for this bullshit. We arrive at the doors of the primary excavation. It has been called so twice, but this is truly the final stand. We fend off against waves of rebels as we wait for the transport platform to arrive and the doors to open. I must say, this mod does a great job of supporting Zen relay grenades. Every place of combat has a ton of big props scattered around, which maximizes the grenade's potential. When the doors finally open, we get hit by a temporal washover of kinds. This one doesn't teleport us away though. We are greeted by a lot of darkness waiting for us behind those doors. We start the transport platform. 
Phone cop talks to us again, saying that with a ship in his hands, they could have bargained. When questioned what they could have bargained for, Phone cop says, Answers for Ava. We respond, Do we believe the cloud bombing will hold up their ass? Look at how much you've done for them. What you have to show for it. Nothing. <laughs> you idiot. This is our last hope. We now move into the aforementioned temporal wall, which features stunning visuals. The anomalies are getting bigger and increasing in rate. We are closer than ever. Also, Wilson says his goodbyes. Uh, boss, I'm, I'm not gonna make it. You're gonna be fine. No, I, I don't think I am. No, you're fine. You're yelling at me. I'm not mad. I'm, I'm just... I'm gonna get you uploaded, remember? I don't blame you for being angry at the world. Don't do this. Don't blame yourself. There are some things in life you don't get over. It's a fact of life, boss. You gotta accept that. Don't. Just remember I believed you. Wilson, stay with me. Get rid of the ship, Blas. Ship? You don't need Wilson. Wilson, he's gone. Maybe I should leave him at the upload station. Man, when I tell you this scene had me tearing up, right behind those doors we find the upload station. He would have needed only a minute more. We still place him in though, and miraculously, his AI gets detected. We don't hear anything from him though. He gets transported into a tunnel with a light at the end of it. Something I interpreted as the afterlife waiting for him. That being if there is a heaven for AIs. We move on to the next room, where we finally get to see it with our own eyes. The goddamn Borealis. A Borealis reveal is very hard to pull off. You first have to prove your mod is worthy, I feel. Just squishing in a Borealis for no reason is not deserved and doesn't sit right. The biggest reaction you can get out of that is, oh look, the Borealis. But this mod built up the Borealis for hours and built up such a big story that is also deeply tied into the story of Half-Life 2, that it does truly deserve the moment. The second thing a Borealis reveal needs is a good looking Borealis. And this is as good as it could possibly look, I think. The Borealis in this game is so perfectly executed. It gave me chills when I first played this mod and it still does. What a great reveal. The next room has a ton of props floating around in the air. Another anomaly? Clonecop is sitting by the door to the bridge that leads to the Borealis. He's dying. He talks about the usual things. He talks about the usual things again. We finally give in and actually start to doubt the combine. Rather than happy, Clonecop is mad about us just now wanting to listen. Clonecop still tells us that we should not trust the combine, which we still deny. We have no arguments though. We simply shout at him that he's wrong. Clonecop says that he's done trying to help us and that he's done with his life. He asks us to put him out. Right after we do this, or not do it, a container lands on him. The flying props turn out to be an advisor, most likely the advisor we were talking to before. The advisor tells us that we deserve a reward. Since our past still troubles us, they offer to remove painful memories, making us the new master template. This reward is mandatory. We try to deny this offer with all due respect, but we have no choice. The advisor picks us up and deletes our memory. We stutter the name of Ava as it slowly gets removed from our mind. We see visions of what looks like a combined planet. We are back in reality. The advisor asks us what the status of our excursion is, to which we respond with exact details. Our mind is wiped. We are now the perfect combined soldier. We get placed down and move a bit. The player is given no control, which I believe to be a symbolization of a free will getting wiped. The credits roll. There is a post credit scene though. We see the combine take over the Borealis and build the infrastructure around it. We see through the eyes of 3650 again. We hear a loud bang, followed by the sound of the gravity gun. We get hit by an explosion. Dog stands in front of her eyes and we get hit in the back by the gravity gun. The resistance came back to take over the Borealis led by none other than what can only be assumed to be Gordon Freeman. You might be asking if this is truly it, to which the answer is a definite no. This is only one of three endings. The other endings are achieved by shooting or kicking the combine advisor before it wipes our mind. A huge boss battle between you and the advisor breaks out. This boss fight is so incredibly well made. If you ever were to fight an advisor in Half-Life, this is how it should be done. You have to dodge the props it throws at you by hiding in little holes in the ground. By throwing Zen relay grenades, they will actually teleport in exclusively Vortigons, which don't fight us at all anymore. We are now an ally of theirs. We eventually beat the advisor. The only way to actually get over to the Borealis is to destroy these little glowing thingies in the pipe. 
I believe these are the same thing he's seen earlier in Arbeit 1. Shooting all of them causes an alarm to sound, which is actually voiced by Wilson. Wilson made it, in some form at least. We are warned of a catastrophic entropic control failure, and that a temporal event is imminent. Wilson warns us that we have to get out of here, which is impossible though. The Borealis sucks us into itself, as it causes the biggest temporal anomaly we have seen yet. We wake up inside the Borealis as it travels through time, place, unsure. However, we see G-Man standing at the front of the ship. You can get the second ending by simply just kicking G-Man, to which he'll put you in a fight you have no chance of winning. But this ending sucks, so let's not kick G-Man. G-Man, who is excellently voiced by the way, tells us that there appears to be a matter of debt. He tells us that all the things we've done in City 10 and with the ship has left our account unbalanced. He tells us that in short, we have bought him time. It seems like we have a favor open. He lets us know that he cannot bring our daughter back. He can however stop the Combine from further cloning us. He says that by removing our imprint, he cannot also disclose what happened to Ava. We are fine with this, because we are sure we didn't kill her. We arrive in what seems to be the facility where all Combine imprints are kept. We get to kill the one of us. G-Man next takes us into our old room, the one we saw in the intro. Before G-Man gets to talk though, he seems scared of something. He apologizes for having to leave us here. After which a large green laser appears from the ceiling of the hallway and we get sucked into it. The credits roll. There is another post credit scene here though. We wake up in a pot being interrogated by an advisor. We seem to be in a lot of pain. The advisor saying that the mental block persists and that we harbor scars from the elusive one, which seems to be referencing G-Man. But that in time they can break through, which is where the game's third ending is. Here's a surprise though. There's actually a fourth ending. If you manage to upload Wilson, which you hopefully did, the advisor will be killed and Wilson will appear on the screen. Wilson got into the Combine systems. He tells us that the Combine are trying to get the ship back, which Wilson says cannot happen. Wilson also gives us a gun, to which we say... Okay. What's the plan? Hell yeah. This is what I believe to be the true ending. There is lots more to talk about though, so hang on a bit. Before I get into lore discussion, I will quickly mention the challenge mode this game has. There are a couple of different challenges. There are a total of 8 locations to choose from, which all have 5 challenges you can complete in them. Least damage, least bullets, least time, least kills, most mass. Most of them are self-explanatory. In most mass, you receive a limited amount of Zen Relay Grenades and must use them to collect the most mass. These are pretty fun to complete. The game also has a workshop, which is pretty cool. It allows you to install custom maps and also model and texture replacements. Let's get into some much needed lore discussion though. First of all, this game as of right now fits into the lore perfectly, no matter the endings. Giving us these two endings, the Combine ending and the Wilson ending, is pretty clever I think. If the Half-Life story ever continues, they have at least two chances of getting it right, as there is some concept art of Half-Life 3 that depicts the Borealis already being taken over by the Combine, I believe that the Combine ending seems like the most plausible one to be canon. Then again, even in the Wilson ending, Wilson mentions that the Combine want to take over the ship, so both endings are very much possible. A big question arises out of this though, should this game be considered official canon? I think there is no way that Valve will consider this game canon. The confirmation of Race X alone is enough for it to not be considered canon. While never officially disputed, there is little evidence for opposing for specifically to be considered canon. However, I wouldn't have any problem with Valve making this canon. It is truly good enough to be official quality. Perhaps it's a little short to be a Half-Life 3, even though this mod is really long at about 3 to 5 hours. But the story and the content of this game and how well it fits into the lore while also creating new things in the lore, mainly the whole Arbit facility, does make it seem like a true sequel. When I say sequel though, I only mean sequel in terms of expanding the Half-Life lore, as this game does take place between Half-Life 2 and Episode 1 and perhaps during Episode 1, except for the post credit scene of the common ending that is. Then again, it goes pretty far into attributing things to the Borealis. The temporal disturbances thing I think sounds really cool and fits really well, though this could easily simply just not fit into Valve's vision. So my conclusion is that while it will be sad to see, this game will most likely fall out of canon as soon as the next Half-Life game releases. It does however definitely serve the purpose of keeping the community happy for the time being. I believe Valve has the capacity to make an even better story, though Bradman, the creator of both parts, has set a pretty high standard here, especially if this is what a free mod manages to do. I have seen people criticizing the amount of fan service this mod gives. I however completely disagree with that point. This shit is cool as hell. Valve has starved out the community for new Half-Life slash Portal lore for years and years. Half-Life 2 Episode 2 released when I was in preschool, so I'm fine with being fed reference after reference personally. It's literally like waking up at night and drinking a glass of water. You simply can't get enough. The only thing I thought felt a little forced or rather unfitting was Cave Johnson's house, but at the same time, why not include it? I will now get into some lore discussion points that will involve very heavy spoilers for Half-Life Alex. So if you have never played that game before and somehow managed to get this far without spoilers, you should skip to the time shown on screen. Alright, let's get into it. G-Man, at the very ending of the game, seems a bit scared. 
At first I thought they were introducing a whole new type of threat that is strong enough to scare the G-men. However, right before writing the script, I have realized that this is only him being afraid of capture again by the Combine. As you know, in Half-Life Alex, the Combine managed to capture G-Man somehow, who then gets freed by Alex at the end of the game. This also explains the green laser that sucks us up and why we were suddenly captured by the Combine at the post credit scene. Also the fact that the old room of 3650 is a room that had a high likeliness of G-Man showing up, as the Combine probably assumed him to be talking to 3650 at some point. Them setting up a trap for him there was a good idea. The advisor calling G-Man the elusive one after he just escaped from them and G-Man saying Not this time. basically all but confirms this. I think interestingly, this could end up being a canon breaking thing though. Obviously half of Alex involves some time travel, which basically splits off two timelines. One where the capture of G-Man happened and one where it didn't. The one where it did, Alex is missing, put in stasis by G-Man. This is the one we play in Half-Life Alex. In Half-Life 2 the capture didn't happen, thus Alex is with us and Eli ends up dying which never happened in the timeline where she is gone. Then again, both timelines meet up once Eli lives again, due to Eli saying G-Man took Alex. This is really confusing and not completely cleared up and will have to be explained by Valve in a future title. Time travel is complicated. However, here's what I think is a law break. I believe that G-Man wanted Eli to live. Gordon failed to complete his task. G-Man can't however simply revive him, so he thought of a way to do so in a way that is legal with his employers. So he traveled back in time, got himself captured on purpose because he knew Alex would free him which would lead him to being able to reward Alex by reversing the future death of her father. This is of course just a theory. A game, but one that I believe to be true. G-Man seemed way too calm when he was captured. Then again, this is time travel stuff and any attempt of providing proof is pretty hard. But G-Man being scared, I think, is the crucial, perhaps law-breaking factor here. But this is all just a theory, so it's fine as of right now. But I believe it will be proven in the future, thus making this G-Man scene not really fit. Unless of course he's talking about another event outside of Half-Life Alex, which could very well be the case to be fair. Also quick note, I find it interesting that he says we bought him time. You have bought me time. I'm interested to know what that means, but I have no clue. I would love to see your theories regarding both that sentence and my theory in the comments. Please do start off your comments with a Half-Life Alex spoiler warning though. Alright, Half-Life Alex spoilers are over now. So, to answer my main question, how exactly did Entropy Zero 2 change Half-Life forever? It did this by changing the way Half-Life mods will be looked at and made from now on. This mod gives you the experience you would expect from a AAA game, only that it's free and actually works on launch. Entropy Zero 2 went out of the comfort zone for Half-Life modding. It attempted and very much succeeded at being way more than just a regular old Half-Life 2 mod that is just a story of another rebel in City 17 or something. Now I don't mean to bash mods that do exactly that even in the slightest. I am personally working on a mod right now with the same premise to be exact. I love mods like those personally, but I feel that it doesn't sound interesting enough for people outside of the community to even consider taking a look at the beauty that is Half-Life mods. Entropy Zero 2 changed that. If you are a fan of Half-Life, this game is as important to play as Half-Life 2 itself. A true milestone in Half-Life modding and definitely something that will be remembered forever by the community. Thanks to it being on Steam, it's as accessible to play as any normal Half-Life game. Not that installing mods from ModDB is that much more difficult. By the way, if you want to get into Half-Life modding yourself, you can check out my 3 great mod series. Also, I might mention something that the creators did that is pretty cool. If you plan to create a Half-Life 2 mod yourself, by giving credit, you are allowed to use most assets you come across in Entropy Zero 2. Assets that were made outside of the team don't count for this though. You can of course also use Entropy Zero 2 as a base for your mod. They do this because they want to help the Half-Life modding community as much as they can, which they are definitely doing. The Half-Life modding scene as a whole has seen a major resurgence since Entropy Zero 2 released. The scene has been alive and well for years, but more people are putting their eyes on it now than seemingly ever. The way Entropy Zero 2 managed to cater perfectly to the Half-Life community by holding up a standard unseen before in Half-Life 2 mods is how I believe it changed Half-Life forever. The credits of the game are rolling in the back right now, and all of the people in that list are absolute legends. Thank you for your hard work. Subscribe for more videos. This was by far the longest video I've ever done. I hope you enjoyed. Check out my other videos. And otherwise, thank you for watching. Oh, and for my rating for Entropy Zero 2, seeing as there is no lasso reference in this one, I will have to give it a 0 out of 10.